Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful day, O God. We thank you for your goodness and for your mercy. We thank you that you are a great God. And Father, we worship you. Lord, I pray today, God, let your Holy Spirit rule, reign, and have authority in our lives, God. Father, I pray, let your word be the driving force, the guiding force of every decision, every thought, every word that comes to our heart. Father, I pray, let your name be magnified in our lives. I thank you, Father, for all these blessings. And we give you praise and we give you glory. And today, Lord, have your way in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Yes, uh, something else that I just remembered was uh, uh, the Catholic Church uh, and, uh, the website. So you, those of you who might have gone to the website, I don't know if you go, but please, I would encourage you to go to the website. We've got a Calvary Church to Moon website. It's called www.calvarytomoon.com. Uh, it's still uh, it's functional and everything, but I'm updating the website right now because uh, I've spoken to Alan and Nancy. They've given me a few tips. So I've changed the whole uh, appearance. I've changed the whole outlook of the website. Uh, mm -hmm. Much more neater, much more sleek, but there's still information that's missing. And we will put the uh, testimonies up on the website soon. So please give me a feedback. Please give me a comments on this. Uh, the website uh, is called www.calvarytumun.com. It's our own church website, which is connected to the mother church, but we have our own website. So please have a look at the website. Uh, feedback, comments, uh, it's still a work in progress, but we'll get there. Amen? And use this as a tool. Amen? Because it's a powerful tool that can be used. Amen? Well, today I will continue on the series that I've been uh, doing this past few weeks. And how many of you remember what I've been talking about? Sorry? On oh, the names of God. Amen. Hallelujah. So you are paying attention. <laughs> it's on the different names of God. And it's been a really an amazing journey. It's been an amazing time as I'm meditating on the different names of God. As God is revealing himself to us through these different names. It's an incredible power. It's an incredible understanding that has never been there. It's like a revelation that is happening week after week. And it's amazing. So far, how many names have you learned? Come on, let me see your memory. Four, Four, Four names. Okay, what are the names that you remember? Come on, first name. Elohim. 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 Yeah. Uh, okay, give me the correction. Elohim in Hebrew, Bar. in the English Bibles, what will it be? Bar. 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 God. Okay, how's the God spelled? G-O-D. G-O-D, thank you very much. I know that G-O-D, but how's it? Capital G, small o, small d. Be specific, come on, because this is what you need to know. Elohim is God, spelled as G-O-D, yes, but capital G, small o, and small d. The next name we learned was? Yahweh. Yahweh. What's the word Yahweh come from? What's the real meaning of the real word of uh, Yahweh? Y-H-W-H. Y-H-W-H. It stands for yod he wa -he. This is the name of God, which is the original name of God. God is called by this name, yod he wa -he. And because there's no vowels in this word, it's difficult to pronounce this word. So the translation translated as Jehovah or Yahweh, which means the same thing, Y-A-H-W-E-H, Yahweh, which means simply as the existing one, the I am. That is the meaning of the all-powerful. We will see that in, a, in the meaning of Yahweh. And uh, we've already seen that, I'm sorry. The third name of God, what we learned was? Adonai. Adonai. How is Adonai? Oh, sorry, how is Yahweh spelled in the English Bibles? There are two ways of, uh, whenever you, how we know what is Yahweh? Capital L, Lord. Lord, okay, Lord. So it's a, what is it? Capital L and small O R D? No. no. Capital it's ca all caps. Capital. When you say Lord in all caps, L O R D, all in capital letters, it is. Yahweh, or you will always see God, G-O-D, all in capital letters. That is Yahweh. We've seen the difference between Elohim, we've seen the difference between Yahweh. Elohim is God, so El basically stands for God. So Elohim could refer to any God, because they would have pagan gods also would refer to Elohim. That's why God says, I am the Lord God, I am Yahweh, your Elohim. So it's very important to understand these factors, okay? So that was the second name we seen. The third name we seen was? Adonai. Adonai. How's Adonai spelled in your Bibles? 
Capital L, small O R D. Capital L, small O R D. That's again lords. Capital L, small O R D. Adonai, which simply means master, master, master ruler, 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 owner. So when you say Adonai, you are looking at God and saying, You are my ruler, you are my owner, you are my master, and I am your servant. So it's a covenant relationship, and we've seen in the Old Testament how a covenant relationship was made between a slave and a master. The slave had to submit, surrender to the master, but in return the master had to provide, had to take care of every need of the slave. And we see the benefits that the slaves had. Okay, that was the third name. Last week, what was the name we learned? El El Shaddai. What does it mean? Almighty God. Almighty God also? All sufficient God. Amen. Thank you. You're paying attention. Good. So we've seen there's four words, four names of God. El Shaddai, which means God Almighty or an all sufficient God. Amen. Hallelujah. Today, I'm going to go with another name of God. Any guesses? Do this because I told you in Bible study. Otherwise, <laughs> you don't know what I've asked in Bible study. Okay, it is none other than the most famous name we all know God by Jehovah Jireh. Jehovah Jireh. Let me get a bit very honest with you, saints. I'm being very honest with you. You know, when I, when I already knew the different names I'm going to do, which we can put in very, and I thought Jehovah Jireh is going to be. One of the easiest names to meditate upon, one of the easiest names to prepare, and one of the easiest names so far to, you know, uh, prepare a message on. And actually this morning, my wife, if you can be my witness, actually, my wife this morning, I'm really struggling with this name. I'm really struggling with this name. I'm really struggling in the sense there's so much in this name, but yet it is so difficult to bring forth in this name. Okay, so let, let me... Let me uh, break it down as I have given a few notes, and uh, uh, I believe the Holy Spirit will lead us. Amen. And uh, this, let me start with this uh, a joke, okay? But one day, this uh, guy, this uh, father and the husband, he's fast asleep and uh, in bed, and all of a sudden his wife wakes him up and says, Sweetheart, honey, get up. Come on, it's time to go to church. You're late. The children are already. I'm ready. You're the only one. So this man gets up and says, okay, honey, give me three good reasons why I need to go to church. Give me three good reasons why I need to go to church. So the wife looks at him and says, okay, the first good reason is because today is a Sunday and you need to go to church on Sunday. So he says, okay, that's, that's a good reason. Give me another good reason, another two more good reasons why you need to go to church. Because, so she says, okay, the second good reason is because God has blessed us, God has blessed you, and you'll be blessed when you go to church. She says, yes, I agree with that also. But give me one more good reason. Then she looks up and says, you've got to go to church because you are the pastor of the church. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you something. Going to church can be a struggle. How many of you can? Going to church can be such a struggle. But my question is, this might be a joke, but you know what? We know it's a Sunday when we go to church. We know we are blessed when we go to church. But sometimes, still, I'm, I'm admitting, sometimes it's a challenge. Sometimes it's a challenge getting up in the morning. Sometimes it's a challenge and saying, God, I'm going to worship you. Yes, Lord, I know my life is blessed. Yes, Lord, I can see all things good happening in my life. Yes, Lord, there are challenges, there are issues. But still, at times, I struggle going to church. I struggle going in fellowshipping. I struggle going in your presence and praising you and worshiping. I struggle. Be honest, saints. Come on. Don't tell me that every Sunday, oh, it's Sunday. Let us go to church. I've had struggles. I know that of what I'm talking about. Like today was a struggle. It's not that I didn't want to come to church. Because today I was more so because I'm a pastor of the church and I'm the one to preach. It was a struggle. I was led to, do I have to go to church today? Because it can be a struggle going to church. It's a struggle coming in the presence of God. But I tell you saints, above all struggles, above all the persecution and the trials you face in life, once you connect with your God, once you really know who your God is, yeah. 
Your attitude will never be the same again. Your life will never be the same again. The way you look at church will never be the same again. The way you look at yourself will never be the same again. It is not that I have to go to church. I want to go to church. I want to be in the presence of the Lord. I need this in my life. And that's the reason I'm telling you, do not take these things for, for lightly. Oh, you say, oh, Pastor, you've got nothing better now. You're filling your time up with the names of God. But understand these names. God is revealing himself to us. These names have power. These names have significance. Yeah. And today I'm talking about to you about this name, Jehovah Jireh. Let me see your knowledge on this name. Okay, one of the songs, I've seen so many songs, Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Jireh. Tons, I think one of the most common names of God used is this this name, Jehovah Jireh. And many people, if they don't know the other names of God, they will all immediately know, even many of the unbelievers would know Jehovah Jireh. Now let me give you a quiz, a question over here, okay. Can you tell me how many times you think approximately does this name Jehovah Jireh appear in the Bible? Come on, give me a We've seen Adonai about 380 times, Yahweh about 400 plus times, uh, Elohim, sorry, Elohim was 380 times, now, how many times does the word Jehovah Jireh appear in your Bible? Hey, 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 no Google searches, okay? <laughs> that's that's the generation today, Google. <laughs> come on, come on. Fast, fast, I know you some of you go on iPhones and check in there. <laughs> come on, come on, guess, 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 give me a guess, give me a guess, come on. Around 2,000 plus. 2,000 plus, very good. 20, Close. something like 23 or 20. Come on, come on. Come on, give some guesses. Come on. Approximately what is the, how many times does this name Jehovah Jireh appear in the Bible? 2,800 or 2,800 something. Okay. Come on. Come on. Give me some guesses. No right or wrong answer. Guess. Guesses. Guess. Come on. Anybody? Alu, come on. Give me a guess. Come on. Hey, 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 hey. Come on. Give me a guess. Somebody give me a guess. Come on. Just one guess? Okay, I'll give you the answer. You can close your Google off. <laughs> the name Jehovah Jireh appears one, one time in the Bible. Aye! Yeah, I don't know. Very close, 1,800, 2,000. Only one time. Just one time in the Bible. Wow. Yeah. Jehovah Jireh. Yeah. The word Jireh appears 200 plus times, but Jehovah Jireh appears only one time in the Bible. Only Jehovah. Genesis. Jehovah Jireh. The word Jehovah Jireh. We'll come into the meaning of it soon. But before we go into the meaning, we need to know the story. We need to know where this name occurs. And this can be found in the book of Genesis. I'm sure you're all very familiar with this. Genesis chapter 22. Let's read the story, okay, over here. One thing I'll pray with you saints right now, because you know what all the struggle was about my life also confirm us. You know, sometimes we get too familiar with the names. And today I pray may not this be a trap to be familiar with the name. I think, you know, one of the reasons why I had a struggle also, because I'm so familiar with this name. Jehovah Jireh, my provider. And you go on and you know, okay. That's all we say. But I'm telling you, let, let not this name be familiar with you today. Today, look at it in a different way. Look at the real meaning, okay? We're coming to the book of Genesis chapter 22. Now it came to pass, I'm reading from verse 1 onwards. And it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham. And said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. Then he said, take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took, on his, uh, and, and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son. He and he split the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place which God had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. Uh, the lad and I will go yonder and worship, and we will come back to you. So Abraham took the wood of burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son. 
and took the uh, and he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and the two of them went together. Verse seven. But Isaac spoke to Abraham his father and said, "My father," he said, "Here I am, my son." Then he said, "Look, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering?" And Abraham said, "My son, God will provide for Himself the lamb for a burnt offering." Now, don't mistake it. This is not where it says Jehovah Jireh. Because they said the Lord will provide. Many people say that, oh, this is where Jehovah Jireh is. This is not Jehovah Jireh. This is uh, come to that meaning. <clears throat> then they came to the place of which God had told him, and Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in order. And he bound his son, uh, and he bound Isaac his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. So he said, Here I am. And he said, Do not lay your hand. On the lad, or do anything to him. For now I know that your fear, that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Then Abraham lifted his eyes and looked, and behind him was a ram caught in the thicket with its horns. So Abraham went out and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. Verse 14. This is where you find the name. And Abraham called the name of the place. The Lord will provide. In the King James version, it says. Jehovah Jireh, and it said to this day, in the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. In some versions, if you have another version, it says, in the mount of the Lord, it shall be seen. If you have a King James version, it will say, in the mount of the Lord, it shall be seen. Um, get, get here what I'm getting over here, okay? Because there are two different words, completely two different words. One is provide, one is seen. In the mouth of the Lord, Jehovah Jireh, which means God provides. In some version it says the Lord will provide. But in some King James version it says the Lord sees. Are two different words. Sees, provides. We'll come on that. Now let me give you, we all know what's in the story. Please don't, don't get so familiar with the story, but just challenge your thinking today, okay? Challenge your thinking a bit over here today. Now you look at Abraham's life. We have uh, seen, so far, we, we, last week we spoke about El Shaddai. At the age of 99, Abraham is crying out, Lord, you know, I still don't have a hair. You have promised me that my inheritance, my generation is going to be so much like the, as the stars and as the sand and the dust and a mighty generation. <coughs> but I'm 99 and we don't have any children yet. And God says, I am El Shaddai. And you see the meaning of El Shaddai is a God Almighty, a might who can work against the forces of nature, a power that can force against, work against the forces of nature. At the age of 99, force of nature says, no way, Jose, you're going to become a father. But God says, I am El Shaddai. And we've seen all that. We've seen how at the age of 77, Abraham is obedient. God just says, see, no, God, he came from a pagan land. He didn't know any God. All of a sudden, God shows up to him and says, Abraham, come on, I'm going to make you into a great nation. Abraham, without questioning, without doubting, leaves his familiarity at the age of 77. How many of you would like to go to a new land at the age of 77? Let me know. Would you? 77 people are planning to retire, settle down at a beach house, smoke a cigar, and enjoy life. At the age of 77, God is challenging Abraham and saying, come on. Come on, young man. I'm going to take you to your promised land. I'm going to take you to a nation. At the age of 77, Abraham is challenged and he is not doubting, no questions asked. Who are you, God? I don't even know you. My fathers are worshipping pagan gods, but who are you? But without any question, without any doubt, Abraham is obedient. He immediately takes his family, his nephew Lord, and he walks out and sets to the direction that God has set him. In the, on the journey we see so many challenges that Abraham faces. He is faced with a, uh, with a king who wants to, uh, because his wife is so beautiful and all those things. And we see how he lies. And we know all the journeys that Abraham has gone through. We see how you know, God blessed him so much that a uh, lot was captured, that he takes 400 of his own servants and goes and fights a battle and defeats three or four armies over there. We see that is all the blessings of God. 99, he is not without a child. He still promises, uh, he's still waiting on the promise, so he goes and takes battle with his own hand and he gets Ishmael through his concubine who is a slave woman, Hagar. And God says, no, no, that's not my plan. My plan is a promised one. The promised one is Isaac. In the scripture we just read, Ishmael was already born. But he says, take Isaac, your son, your only son. Because God never sees Abraham, uh, Ishmael as Abraham's covenant son. The covenant is through Isaac. That's why till day, today you have war between Ishmael and Isaac. 
you would have war between the Muslims and the Jews. From that day on, the war, because let me tell you something, this is not a, a territorial war or a war that's on, a, on ground and oh, they want Jerusalem and they want Jaff, uh, uh, Gaza and all those things. No, no, this is a spiritual war. Because there's an enemy that's already been sown, uh, sown between Ishmael's seed descendants. That's all the Muslims come from the Ishmaelites. They are called the Ishmaelites. And the Jews, that's Isaac, the promised one. So there will be a war. And there will be peace only when the Prince of Peace comes. Yes, it's a duty to pray for the peace of Jerusalem and all that. But what I'm getting over here, God is challenging Abraham. And the challenge is not an easy one. Can you imagine now, this is a time... It's Isaac, or what the story is happening. Isaac is a good 12 or 13 years old. When Abraham and Isaac, he was, when God promised he was 99, so by the time Isaac was born, he was 100, 100 years old. He was already a century. Now it's 13 years later, so Abraham is approximately about 112, 113 years old. Okay, now this is definitely a time to retire. Don't you agree? <laughs> I agree. 113 years old. Abraham could have easily been relaxing and said, I am well settled. God, you've been so faithful. You know, I've seen your ups. I've seen all the challenges in my life. And I am really well settled. When I look back, God, glory to you. But I am telling you now, it's one of the greatest challenge that has come in Abraham's life. There's no challenge that has been greater than this challenge that has come in Abraham. Just think of it, sir. Saints, Abraham has promised a child. For a long time, he waited for a promise. Now he gets his child. His desire, this promise, and God is saying, this is the child through whom the generations are going to come through. And now God is asking a sacrifice of that very blessing. God is asking, can you imagine, I can just imagine uh, Abraham's thoughts. He will say, God, how is your promise going to be fulfilled? How is my generation, this is my son, and through him the generations are going to come. But if you're going to ask me to offer him, how? How are my, how is all your promises going to be fulfilled in my life? How are the generations and the generations going to come? If this is what your promises, I'm sure there was a lot of doubts, a lot of questioning. I'm sure Abraham was shaken to the core. There's nobody in this place who can even connect to a little bit of what Abraham was feeling at that time. I'm sure he might have been there, like the earth taken beneath his feet and he just, with his feet and he just sunk into it. He's such in deep remorse. The Bible doesn't say much about it, but the Bible just says he did not even question. God says, Abraham, Abraham, he says, here I am, Lord. He says, take your son, your one and only son, whom you love. Whom you love. See, God is not asking you to give, sacrifice your enemies. God is not asking you to go take your enemy and sacrifice him as a burnt offering. God is asking whom he dearly loves. I believe God will challenge you with many things in your life, saints. In what you love. In today's, God is not asking you to take it to the altar and burn it and carry it physically, but He's spiritually asking you, can you sacrifice the thing that you love for God? Can you bring it to God, to the altar of God? If God has blessed you with that, what does Job say? When everything was, you know, that man is a, a real great a testimony of faith. He, one day, Everything is taken out. And what he says, Naked I've come from a mother's womb, naked I will go. The Lord gives, the Lord takes away. But blessed be the name of the Lord. And I'm sure Abraham was saying the same thing in his heart. Because there was no question. God commanded him. He immediately obeyed. Can you think of it? Can you think of it? That God is saying, Abraham, come on. Sacrifice your one and only son. And Abraham says, yes, Lord. And the challenge is the battle that's going through his mind right now. But he's preparing everything, getting ready. And he tells him, see, God didn't tell him to sacrifice his son any in any place. He was all in the land of Hebron. But God asked him to sacrifice on Mount Moriah. I'll come to that very quickly. Because that's a very, very significant thing for you to know. God chose the place where he wanted to sacrifice Isaac. And that's why you see the last verse, it says, on this mount, the Lord will provide the Lord sees on this holy mount, on his mount, because that was the mount of the Lord, which he had chosen. I'll come to that in a, <coughs> in a bit. But the challenge that is going through, but you can see there's absolutely no confrontation, there's absolutely no place of uh, lethargicness or complacency. Abraham obeys immediately. And today I want to challenge you, saying, when God speaks to you something, obey. 
Do not dilly dally. Do not play around with the promise. God speaks to you. Obey. Because that will be a blessing upon your life. You don't know where is God's ways. Because God says, my ways are not your ways. You won't understand. And over here, I can still see a faith in Abraham. As you go through the scriptures, you see, he takes the firewood, he takes two of his servants, he takes his son, and they're walking. Now far off you can see the mountain which God told him. Far off you can see Moriah. What he tells the servants. You just read, what he told the servants. Stay here. Stay here. Stay here. Why? Who comes back? We. That's the key thing. Why? We come back. Abraham is still holding on to faith that he and Isaac will come back. Because he knows he's going to, he could have said, while well, I come back. But he's saying, while well, we come back. Abraham, till this point, is still believing God. God, I know you're not going to take my son. But you asked me to sacrifice it, I will sacrifice it. And he tells his servants in faith, stay here while we come back. Is that we come back, why? And we will come back to you. We will come back to you. Can you see the faith that Abraham is holding? He's called the father of faith. He's still holding on to faith. God, yes, I'm being obedient to you. God, I know that, but we will come back. Because this is your promise to me, God. He's coming back with that faith. We will come back. And then they go over here. And Isaac asks a very interesting question. Verse 7. But Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father, and he said, Here I am, my son. And he said, Look, the fire and the wood. But where is the lamp for the word offering? Now, let me tell you, Isaac was not a baby, okay? Isaac was not like a small baby, two year old. He was a 13 year old boy. He was a 13 year old boy. He was well familiar with all the things that was happening. He knew that he needed a lamp for a sacrifice. He knew because he's seen his father perform a lot of sacrifices before. Yeah. So he's, he's grown up with the attitude of sacrifice. He's grown up and he's aware of what is happening right now. And he's saying, Dad, I think you're getting old, Dad. <laughs> you're 112 years old, but Dad, you're forgetting something. You've got the wood, you've got the fire, but where's the land? <laughs> and Abraham says, my son, God will provide for himself. This is a powerful, powerful statement that Abraham is working over here. Yes. He's saying that God will provide for himself. Amen. So the two went up together. <laughs> And we know as what happens, and go up further. And they came to the place where the Lord told them, and Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood. Uh, sorry, uh, God told them that Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in order. And he bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And there's a lot of there's a lot of deep teaching in the scriptures in But you know, I just want to touch on a few things. Oh, here the first thing you will see: what what did Abraham do? He built an altar. Yes, he comes and builds an altar. And what he does? Place the wood in order. order. We don't we don't pay attention to these words, right? So, uh, place the wood in order. Mm -hmm. Well, if he's burning his son, he's just burning it. He could have just thrown the wood, right? Think of it. Think of it. He's just he could have just thrown the wood. You know, I'm going to put my son tied up there. This signifies when you have God as an authority in your life, your life will be in order. Placing everything in order is God according to how we want. Because if I'm doing something for God, I will do everything in order. It's not nothing happens. Like, oh, so today I feel like going to church. Or today I feel like helping somebody. Today I feel like being good. It's not happens as a thought. But when you are, God will put your life in order. When you go, you will be moved with compassion. God looks at your, when you look at your family, you will put your family in order. Abraham puts the wooden altar. 